this summer. This week saw the commemoration of 200 years since Karl Marx's birth. The University of Johannesburg held a birthday party for him in Johannesburg. And in celebrations in China, Premier Xi Jinping hailed him as the greatest thinker of the modern world. Professor Patrick Bond from the Witt School of Governance joins us in studio for more on this. Thanks so much for your time on SABC News. One of Marx's ideas, simply put, is that capitalism works because value is stolen from workers and transferred to the employers. How does this idea translate, say, 150 years later? Oh, very well. Actually, that's called the labor theory of value. But there are complications. So if you apply that in South Africa, you have to make sure that you're aware of the race angle during apartheid and continuing, and gender, because women have helped to make labor especially cheap because the apartheid system uh, with its Bantustan policy meant sure that women had to reproduce that male worker to come to the city. That meant uh, subsidies from women in the form of uh, childcare, um, medical uh, support to injured and, and, and sick workers, and pensions, which didn't really exist under capitalism for blacks. And so a racialized analysis of the labor theory of value is important. You know, also we're becoming aware that Marx dealt with what he called the metabolic, metabolic rift, the, the, the sort of rift, the difference between society and the natural conditions. And now that we're heating the climate up and we're threatening our oceans and species degradation is occurring, certainly Marxists today are much more eco-socialist in their orientation than Marx would have been before these conditions became more extreme. But the basic thesis, especially that this labor theory of value helps you understand why we have financial crises that are melting down lots of uh, the world, Argentina this week, for example, yeah. and South Africa still to come again. That's really critical. Most economists don't read Marx. They don't understand crisis tendencies. Um, Marx's criticism of capital is well known. How do we balance this criticism of capitalism with the fact that it's also the most productive economic system in the world? Oh, indeed. That's Marx's first acknowledgement, if you read the Communist Manifesto, uh, that the productive forces, the machinery especially, and the ability to pull workers from feudal <coughs> conditions of of control, uh, our apartheid system is a good example, and move them into a more modern system in which workplace democracy is possible because workers come together. Um, and that's in turn threatened by over productivity, over production. And we just heard a segment on the fourth industrial revolution. What a great example of mechanizing everything, robots taking over everything, artificial intelligence, even threatening jobs like academics. Um, and if that happens, then the contradiction in capitalism bursts out, and that is that there aren't workers to consume the goods that are being bought. That was the central contradiction of overproduction in capitalism. Mm. Seems mm. as though a lot of his ideas are taking place now. An example is the fourth industrial revolution. As you spoke about him predicting that machines would replace humans in a lot of jobs in his then unpublished manuscript, Fundamentals of Political Economy. How then do we take knowledge that's been around for over 150 years and implement it now in a way that actually matters instead of just theorizing about what he said? Oh, absolutely. The, the forces of production outrun the relations. That's his central argument, that the old-fashioned, you know, your, your 150 million Randy, your Whitey Basson kind of characters and your, your you know, Steinhoffs and all the scandals and corruption that we have is really part of a system that's gone rotten. And if it can be swept away, the benefits exactly of the technology. So the best example in reality must be to make what was a monopoly patent on AIDS medicines uh, generic and also free. Now it cost $10,000 a year, 125,000 rand a year, about 15 years ago to get those AIDS medicines. And we needed about 4 million. That's how many people now get them. And they were controlled by multinational corporations. So the struggle, the Marxist struggle, I think, uh, by the Treatment Action Campaign was to decommodify, to take those medicines and make them free through the public health service. You know what the results have been? Our life expectancy went from 52 uh, to 64 over the last 15 years because of liberating the forces of technology, taking them out of corporate hands, decommodifying, deglobalizing, making them as generics here in, in Midrand, uh, South Africa, and getting them to millions of people. That's the best example of a reality-driven socialist project, a commons of intellectual property.
And very briefly, you've spoken about the African context, uh, looking through a uh, lens of Marxism in apartheid South Africa. Could you move that into the present now and perhaps propose solutions using Marxism for the current uh, challenges that we face today? Well, aside from, say, treatment action campaign winning those free medicines, what a, what a great example. Um, we've had some amazing class struggles. For example, here in Johannesburg, our water system uh, is actually... Basically, you get a bit of free basic water if you're uh, low income, but it used to be under the control of Suez, the, the biggest French uh, multinational water corporation, and s a class struggle, especially from Soweto, forced it back to the public sector. We've got so many other examples. I mean, even our students demanding decommodified education, that fees must fall, that low-paid workers be brought in to the universities insourced, uh, and therefore paid a, a living wage. But you know, in this country, it's the most extreme site. Because, you know, we have the angriest working class in the world here. Out of 180 countries measured by the World Economic Forum regularly, the South African proletariat is the angriest. And then we have the most corrupt capitalist class, um, the PricewaterhouseCoopers. Just in February, they did their last survey. We're usually beating the likes of the Nairobi and the Paris bourgeoisie, our, our uh, Santon, and mostly whitey. Uh, corrupt uh, capitalists. I think these set the conditions with the worst inequality in the world, the World Bank just confirmed that again, for um, a, some kind of socialist discourse that you don't really find in too many other countries. Maybe Jeremy Corbyn in Britain, maybe Bernie Sanders in the United States, and maybe Xi Jinping in China will finally uh, begin to balance that extreme capitalism of China. And those are the kinds of options that I think should be in the public debate. And if Karl Marx helped us do that 200 years ago when he was born, 151 years ago when he wrote Das Kapital, we shouldn't uh, turn away. We should embrace that tradition. Professor Patrick Bond from the Witt School of Governance, thanks so much for your time on FABC News. It's time for a short break. I'll have more business news when we come back. Please stay with us.